Uh, welcome to this Protein Production Technology International exclusive. Uh, I'm joined today by Ingrid Dina and David Andrew Quist from Norwegian Mycelium or NOMI. Um, before we get started on the company and what you guys do, it's very nice. To, it's nice to learn a bit about you. Um, so, Ingrid, can I start with you? What's been your own individual journey into the food tech uh, sector? So, I actually started my career in big tech, and I've spent almost 15 years at Google and YouTube. Okay. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, relevant and like synergies and things to bring into the startup world. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to name a few, uh, the innovation mindset, the pace, uh, building strong culture and teams, uh, and the focus on technology. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew that after, after Google, I really wanted to work with the climate technology. Uh, and when I was introduced to David, I was quickly convinced that the world of fungi it's a very exciting area to go into. Uh -huh. And uh, David, yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm trained as a fungal biologist, a mushroom scientist, so I've been working with food over my entire career. Uh, a big chunk of it actually has been in food system sustainability, both on the technical side, but also on the policy side. So I spent a lot of my career really focused on food. Um, I took a pause from the politics side of things and opened my own restaurant. So I'm also a restaurateur and developed a food concept um, using fungi and fermentation uh, in the core of our dishes. So uh, I've been both a, a food scientist, but also a, a food actor uh, on, on, a, on a very, very local level. So, so very different backgrounds for both of you, but uh, together it's the perfect cocktail for this uh, <laughs> nascent food tech industry. So can you give us a brief summary of uh, NOMI? How did it come to be? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, as I said, fungi has been a part of my uh, my training and my history. You know, fungi is this, is an area of life that is really going through a zeitgeist uh, the last years and exploring fermentation, how it can transform foods, particularly on the sustainability side. And this is something that the restaurant focused on quite a bit, using fermentation to create delicious uh, ingredients and using all of the animal or plant from a sustainability standpoint. And it really just got thinking, and we were using mycelium in our dishes and so forth, uh, and microproteins. And we thought, you know, what if we could use this technology, we're using it to feed, uh, to feed hundreds of people, but what if we could use it to feed millions? Mm -hmm. And that was really the genesis of Nomi. So, you know, here's this, you know, fungus scientist talking a big game about fungi. And I was able to meet this uh, Ingrid, this, you know, the Google executive and people are like, okay, a Google executive and a mushroom scientist is starting a company. All right, let's see what's going to happen here. <laughs> so it's been a, a great journey so far. Um, we're just getting started. We just did a technology shift about 18 months ago. So uh, really kind of set uh, our current pathway. So even though we've been around for about three years since 2020, really what we've been working on focused has only been the last, say, 18 months uh, in the area of uh, using mycoproteins, particularly for feed ingredients here in Norway. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to come on to some of the milestones. It's been a big year for you. I know there was a big investment um, announcement quite recently. Um, I mean, what are your key goals for 2024? We have something really exciting happening at the beginning of next year, 2024, uh, and that is establishing our pilot facility here in Oslo. So that's a really big step from, uh, for us, moving from lab uh, to pilot scale where we can demonstrate uh, the scalability of our products. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing we'll be focusing on is, is uh, getting proof that our products are functioning in feed. Uh, so we're doing feed trials. Uh, and the third one I'd like to mention is around collaboration. Uh, so we're putting a lot of focus on, on partnerships. Uh, we have a partner innovation model uh, where the focus is to build those relationships across the value chain. So from side stream producers to end customers, but also research institutes and scale up partnerships. Mm -hmm. so we're going to talk the... now about, sorry, go on, Ingrid. Yeah, so that's the focus for 2024. Okay, lots of exciting things happen. And we're yeah. going to talk now about the use of um, sustainable feedstocks and everything you do there, it's, it's, it's about the circular economy. Um, so let's talk about those feedstocks in the fermentation process. I mean, how do you assess um, the environmental impact of different feedstock options? Yeah. So, I mean, as Ingrid mentioned, I mean, Nomi's focus is to utilize um, large volume, but low value, at least how they're valorized today, side streams or byproducts from the food industry. So why side streams? I mean, this is a massive amount of uh, nutrient dense uh, process waters and side streams that are literally being undervalued or being thrown away today. So from a waste standpoint, uh, this is this is something we need to address. Um, 
So definitely on assessing the feedstock, it's an environmental impact that we can have. And so we look at what matches well with the fungi that we work with, the processes that we work with, so we can create a, um, a good process with it. The other side of it is in the economic side, I mean, up to 40% of the input costs can be from the feedstock. So this allows us to be very competitive in terms of the types of products that we can deliver. And particularly with our focus on feeds, it's a very price sensitive market. This allows us to be uh, best in class comparing to say other alternative proteins. But, mm -hmm. but beyond that, Nick, I mean, our model as, as Indy mentioned is a partnership based model. So we go into specific facilities and look at how their process is set up. How could we could design the system to use those side streams before they become waste to keep them in a food grade um, standing and be able to save water, be able to save energy, be able to recycle some of those water and, and, and in effect lead uh, to a situation where we can help decarbonize this industry and, and solve two, way, two problems with one solution, a waste problem by using these side streams, getting more out of the system and a, a feed or a food sufficiency problem by able to create more um, delicious and nutritious ingredients from, from fungi. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are some of the key considerations when choosing between those um, different feedstock options for, for any specific fermentation process? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to come down, down to uh, what the cost and what the scale of those feedstocks are, how, how variable those feedstocks are. If they're very variable, it presents a challenge, uh, which we're addressing uh, in how we're developing our processes because we need to have a consistent product quality out the backside. So Nomi is developing new technologies and new approaches to be able to deal with that variability, to be able to take these side streams, which typically have not been valorized for that for, for that reason, and be able to make valuable, consistent products out the other end. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of food waste in the food sector. Um, happens at various ends of the uh, uh, the value chain itself. So circular economy um, is an important factor. Um, now, in what ways does the process um, that you guys are utilizing contribute to that circular economy in food and feed? So David uh, talked a little bit about how we work with uh, food industry companies and valorizing their side streams. And I've been surprised how big of a problem that is. Um, and uh, these companies are now seeking partners and seeking mm -hmm. solutions uh, to get rid of this problem. So it's mm -hmm. a very good timing for us to go in and, and talk to these companies. Uh, and then fermentation, as David has mentioned as well, is, is just have like these amazing capabilities of being able to transform these side streams into high value products. Uh, so we're really helping that industry uh, solve a very, very big problem. Mm -hmm. Could you the... elaborate? Oh, sorry, go on, Ingrid. Yeah, that's that's it. Could you elaborate on any of those um, strategies, those innovative strategies that you're employing to ensure that closed loop system or, or minimize waste um, in the yeah. supply chain for alternative proteins companies? Uh, again, as we focus on a partnership based model, we're able to, you know, the ultimate situation that we, we seek out is one where our feedstock suppliers are also our end, our end users. So this allows us a really tight closed loop system uh, to be able to help modify their processes, design waste out of the production f uh, system, be able to save uh, in various areas, and then be able to transform that, that's those side streams into a high value product that can be brought back into their system. So the idea of a co-located facility to keep these loops tight is where we can have the most sustainability and economic impact in what we're building. And so Nomi's focus is these partnership-based models to be able to create these systems at the, at the factory level and then scale that out or scale that up at that factory and scale it out into other factories with similar problems around the mm -hmm. world. Um, now you're, you're tackling, I know you're, you're, you're looking at human food, but you're, you're tackling um, feed uh, aqua feed um, primarily at the start. Now the aqua feed industry itself faces several challenges um, impacting sustainability, efficiency and overall gro growth. In what ways is NOMI looking to address these challenges with your solution and model? So mainly by providing uh, an alternative feed ingredient. So mm -hmm. uh, Nick, did you know that nearly 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions from aqua feed, no, from aquaculture comes from the feed? Right. Uh, it's just It's just a crazy number. Mm -hmm. um, so this is actually made the Norwegian government uh, put a social mission to know in the next, say, 10 years uh, on, the, uh, on pushing on developing more locally produced sustainable uh, feed ingredients. Uh, so this is a very big focus for Norway, um, and I expect other countries to start having this focus as well, because this is a global problem. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where we come in uh, with our circular and scalable solutions. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Aquafeed traditionally contains fish meal, fish oil sourced from wild caught fish. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts on the medium and long term prospects for this particular sector and, and hence the future demand for your sustainable, cost effective alternatives? Yeah. You know, uh, species like salmon require a lot of protein, um, high quality protein. And traditionally, this has come from fish meal uh, also. And now it's been replaced uh, in part by soy because of the volumes at play. It just is massive volumes that these industries need uh, in order to uh, in order to produce the nutrition necessary. So neither of these fish meal or soy is considered to be a sustainable long term uh, option, given we have overfished uh, the oceans in search of fish meal and um, the expansion of soy is putting pressure on biodiversity, rainforest, et cetera, where they're being grown. So we need to find these alternatives and we need find ones that are scalable uh, and can produce at a price point and a consistency that the uh, the industry demands. So that's really where we're focusing our energy. Mycoproteins, the research today is showing that it, it is a high quality protein. Uh, has the amino acid balance necessary. Uh, it, we call it a protein with benefits because uh, mm -hmm. actually it has beta glucans in its cell wall, which can, uh, can impart uh, health benefits in the form of uh, being an immunostimulant. Uh, so it has a number of features that research is showing can uh, replace fish meal to a certain extent and definitely soy uh, as a high quality but low cost at scale uh, ingredient. Mm -hmm. Now, optimizing feed efficiency is also essential to reduce the feed conversion ratio. So do you have any stats about the NOMI solution in terms of FCR? Yeah, it's early days for mycoproteins. The research that's being done today, particularly on rainbow trout and salmon, which are key species uh, here in Norway, recircular uh, uh, RAS systems here in the Nordics are heavily focused on, on uh, rainbow trout. And the FCR, the, the feed conversion ratios, are showing, they're showing an improved feed conversion ratio over conventional proteins by substituting with mycoproteins. So impacts on growth, digestibility, and as I mentioned, uh, fish health, which translates into better fish livelihoods. Uh, it's hitting on all the key metrics and showing great promise is what we're, we're really excited to be able to, to deliver this and, and actually do something not only, again, for sustainability, but also for fish health, which is a massive issue in aquaculture. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about the costs as well already, but um, the cost of feed ingredients significantly, significantly impact the, co the economics of aquaculture. So in what ways is, is your NOMI process more cost effective? So the cost, you're right, Nick, the cost is uh, affecting it significantly. And, and that's still going to be a focus for feed, feed producers and, and fish producers. Having said that, they're also on the lookout for more sustainable options. Uh, mm -hmm. So there, we see a willingness to pay slightly more for a sustainable ingredient. Uh, and we also think there will um, a potential gap will be bridged with future tax and, and incentive schemes. Having said that, we're working towards uh, an extremely cost-effective process. Um, we are com competing against products that have existed for uh, a very long time uh, and that have been optimized in terms of cost-effectiveness. But we think with, by using fermentation, an extremely scalable approach, and that can be done locally as well, so you remove kind of all the transport logistics, um, that will help us uh, reach or at least be close to, to price parity uh, with uh, conventional products. Uh, uh, to, to build on that, Nick, I mean, the other beautiful thing about working with fungi is that we basically let nature do what nature does, right? Transform nutrients into, into biomass. And this biomass, we use high protein, already approved uh, strains uh, to be able to make our, our feed ingredients. So essentially, we can offer a solution in which have very low cost uh, unit operations, low low energy unit operations compared to the alternatives on the market to be able to deliver a product at the lowest price point possible. So this really gives us a comparative advantage to other alternative ingredients that require higher degrees of pre-processing and post-processing to make a viable and high quality product. We just let fungi do what it does uh, and tap into that natural uh, diversity uh, to be able to, to deliver the high quality ingredients that the, the industry needs. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to uh, what uh, Ingrid uh, described as the valley of death, which I love. It's scaling and capital, uh, two huge challenges for any company in this sector. So I mean, how do the economics, and you, you might not know this yet, given you haven't moved to the next scale, but how do the economics of fermentation change when using sustainable feedstocks on a larger scale? I guess you'll find that out when you move to that bigger pilot next year. 
Yeah, um, I mean, uh, again, it's a game changer to be able to tap into these sustainable feedstocks. I mean, the, the easy approach would have been just to use sugar, right? I mean, that's what a number of companies do in fermentation uh, because you're going to be able to hit, hit the highest productivity. But, you know, Nomi made the choice. We want to have both market and environmental impact in what we do. So we're investing in the research, investing in uh, novel strategies to be able to tap into these feedstocks uh, to deliver, again, both on price but also on environment, which is uh, these two very important metrics if we're going to develop and and and, and make a more sustainable fo uh, food system for the future. Mm -hmm. So it's really focusing on the feedstock side of things to be able to tap into these and be able to make a consistent product, which is where we're spending a tremendous amount of energy so we can deliver the solutions needed for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested to know, what's your take on the current investment landscape? I mean, given the challenges, how can startups um, attract the cash needed to get off the ground? I would lie if I, I said it will be easy right now uh, to get investment. It's been it's been a challenging year, I think, for for a lot of startups, but also for investors uh, attracting investments to their funds. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as a startup, you need to be uh, extremely focused on the things that investors need to see to take take down the risk. Uh, they're much more cautious right now. Uh, they're sitting more on the fence, waiting uh, to see what happens. Uh, so that means you need to be an even stronger case uh, than you probably would have uh, just a year or two ago. So, so I think for startups uh, looking for funds right now, um, I think having um, having the proof points to to what the market is and having commitments from customers in the market, I think that's that's key. Uh, also, an extremely strong plan in terms of scalability and how you're going to get there. Uh, do you have the right team in place and the right partners? Um, so I think just like painting an extremely compelling uh, picture uh, for investors and, and having those proof points to mm. show that the market is there. Uh, this is a significant problem that needs your solution. Mm. Um, I think that's that's the core. Yeah. Uh, so where are you guys in terms of funding? I know we, we published a, a news announcement recently on our website about uh, I think it was a grant or from the Norwegian government. <laughs> That's correct. So things are coming coming together nicely right now. So we just closed our what we call our seed plus round, uh, where we had some of our existing investors doing follow on, but we also attracted a few uh, few very strong investors mm. uh, on top of that. And in addition, we got the grant from the research uh, council that you're referring to, um, as well as Innovation Norway. Uh, so the round ended up being um, being very good for us. And that gives us a little bit of um, a space to be able to work on our scale up uh, at the beginning of 2024 uh, before we start preparing for our Series A uh, that we're expecting to kick off at the end of 2024. Mm -hmm. now, so I will have, have a big break, uh, <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> well, good luck with uh, all of those future um <laughs> Wins. I'm sure they will be a win. And we know there's been a lot of um, attention for the fermentation technologies, especially even in the uh, current economic climate. So um, another big challenge for companies in the alternative protein sector is regulations. Now, in terms of regulations, do you have any headaches when it comes to approvals for your products? I mean, and how do you discern the challenges between the feed and the food sector, the human food sector? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a great question. I mean, you know, what we what we face and what I think other companies that are looking at sidestream space is, is the regulatory environment was not set, it was set up for a linear food system, not a circular one. And so there's a lot of work to be done to create the scientific knowledge and do the assessments in order to be able to um, modify the regulations um, in a safe way, again, with scientific knowledge for circular solutions to be able to be utilized. So this is again about sidestreams, if they're class, how they're classified um, how they can be used, um, how you keep them in food or feed grade status. So there's a number of challenges there. Um, I mean, Nomi's approach is looking at side streams, yes, but also feeds. So the, there is a regulatory environment, but uh, we, it allows us to tap into a broader range of side streams uh, and have a go-to-market strategy that has less uh, hurdles in front of it. Uh, we also need to test and show the performance um, of our product, but uh, it's uh, you know a bulk um, a bulk ingredient that we can uh, deliver at scale. So we don't need to convince as opposed to food. Uh, we don't have to look at perhaps uh, novel food um, regulations, uh, which is a significant hurdle. 
um, and you know convincing and individual consumers. It's very much you know you have to look at sales and distribution and so forth. So it's a much easier play uh, focusing on feeds. And the other thing is just where we are located in the world. I mean, uh, we this is a massive industry here in Norway that wants to. Um, in cr- grow by five times in the next 30 years. So the need for proteins and the impact that we can have by delivering sustainable mycoproteins to the industry is is much larger. The other side of it is strains. So fungi is this very exciting um, um, group of organisms to work with because of their metabolic and enzymatic diversity, the types of products we can work with. But right now, there's a very few strains that are approved uh, mm-hmm. for food or feed usage. Um, that is starting to change, but it takes time to develop the knowledge and to go through the regulatory environment, which is therefore a very good reason. Uh, to, but we need to create the knowledge to be able to utilize a broader range of strains. And then it's just such an exciting field to work with. We're just scratching the surface of what fungi can deliver. So um, we're actually going to be looking further into how to new strains uh, with new potentialities uh, moving forward. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, microproteins are fascinating. Um, so what market trends or consumer insights are driving the adoption of these products? Do you think? Yeah, if I could uh, take take a stab at that, I mean, you you see a number of different things. I mean, it is sustainability a certain amount? It's health, clean labels. Um, you know, the ability to be able to deliver a product uh, that doesn't go through a lot of processing, be able to deliver on taste and texture. Um, I think other types of fermentation coming in for flavorings, uh, I think there's a number of ways fermentation, biomass and other types of ferment, traditional fermentation can be combined to make really amazing products. Uh, but, you know, consumers are, 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 are flipping over the label and they're reading it and they're interested in health. Of course, they're price conscious as well. Um, but they also have high demands uh, that haven't been met uh, in the plant based field for taste and and, uh, and and texture. So we're hoping and we think that my, uh, mycoproteins can deliver on that. And there's the also functionality. Uh, Mycelium-based ingredients also have good gelling, foaming, emulsifying properties, and can replace other types of animal-based ingredients uh, in new types of foods uh, going forward. So there's a lot of exciting research being done and a lot of exciting uh, research that needs to be done to show the full potential of, of mycoproteins. I mean, David, you're clearly Mr. Fungi. Um, are there any potential novel applications or product developments envisioned for microproteins beyond that current scope? Ab- absolutely. We're working on a few of them that I can't share with you now, but uh, mm-hmm. hopefully maybe in the future. But there's a lot of exciting areas uh, that's going to, I think, really impact nutrition in, in, in a big way. Mm-hmm. And how do you anticipate microproteins impacting the overall um, landscape of alternative proteins go in the one. food industry? <laughs> in the food in the food industry, yeah. I mean, look, uh, look at the pioneer corn uh, in the UK. Uh, they have been around for what 30, 30 plus forty years, mm-hmm. and they are one of, if not uh, Europe's largest, you know, plant based. Uh, producer with an array of different types of products. They've showed the flexibility and the, the versatility of mycoproteins. And, you know, there will be more corns, uh, companies like corn coming to be able to deliver at massive scales mm-hmm. the kinds of uh, ingredients and uh, foods that we're going to need to be able to shift to more sustainable food systems. So I think that we're just getting at the beginning of it as we're seeing new corn companies. Maybe, you know, me will be one of those. Right now we're focused on feeds. Uh, that's going to be able to deliver at scale and has already proven a scalable technology uh, moving forward. So I, I think that we're just getting started with microproteins and corn has been you know, a, a very successful pioneer uh, leading the way. I'm just wondering, obviously, you probably pay close attention to what else is happening in the industry. I mean, what particular areas excite you that you know, aren't your core focus? Yeah, I would say, I mean, as the alternative protein, particularly around fermentation uh, matures, you're seeing a lot of segmentation in the industry. You're seeing not companies that are op- that are offering end to end solutions uh, or focused on product development, but companies like Nomi that are very good and very focused on process development to be able to tap into new new uh, processes, new side streams. But also those that are offering new bioreactor solutions, scale up solutions, new strains, these kinds of different, you know, so-called pick and shovel um, portions of the value chain. There's a lot of exciting uh, work being done in there that's going to really help uh, companies to be able to innovate in fermentation, particularly biomass, but also precision fermentation so that we can uh, we can have that impact uh, in the market that, uh, you know, 
that really is the potential. You see some of these charts, Nick, of like the hype curve and you see biomass fermentation sitting, you know, right, getting up near the peak of that. Uh, it's time for biomass fermentation and for fermentation to deliver. It'll be interesting to see how this shakes out um, moving forward. But uh, we really uh, feel that biomass fermentation is going to be one of those areas uh, that's going to deliver. And with these picks and shovels, companies coming to help enable that uh, that shift to using fermentation, it's super exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, Ingrid, you know, who are the Googles of this uh, food tech sector? What are the, what are the technologies that uh, excite you? That's a very good question. If you're at the Googles, I think that's... Uh, Nomi. That's Nomi. <laughs> <laughs> right answer. I don't, I don't know any of the other food tech companies having Google, ex-Google employees employed. So I think that must be us, Nick. <laughs> Great answer. And uh, finally, both of you, um, how do you foresee this market evolving? Well, uh, on, on foods particularly. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, I wish I, we wish we had the crystal ball, right? It's, it's difficult to say. What, what I hope to see is that we see the investments in infrastructure, the capital going into the fermentation space in general, that's going to be required to actually do this. I mean, you see how many fermentation companies, there isn't the fermentation capacity for all these companies to succeed. So there needs to be a massive influx in capital that's going to be in infrastructure development in order for the industry to flourish. And, and we want to see we want to see the industry flourish uh, beyond Nomi. Uh, we're going to need to do this at scale. We're going to need a lot of uh, similar companies to be able to make that impact. So I think that's where if we have the capital, I think that we're going to see that impact made. But the, the crystal ball is difficult to say. But is that capital going to flow and where is it going to flow from? Is it going to come from the private sector? Is it going to come from uh, the public sector supporting this, uh, this shift. That's, it's early days to say they're both pointing fingers at each other right right now. So it's just like, you know, you take it. No, you take it. Um, uh, so we're looking into both um, possible um, ways of funding uh, what we're building. We see good opportunities in both. But that's really what's going to determine uh, how successful the industry is going to be is that, is that infrastructure development. Ingrid, any predictions? Yeah, no, agreed to that in terms of capital infrastructure. Um, I think the health aspect of plant-based and alternative products is, is going to be very important as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we need not just plant-based products out there, but they need to be really healthy. Um, so there's been quite a lot of criticism around the processing mm -hmm. of, of plant-based products. Uh, so I think they need to be both, both sustainable and nutritious and tasting, good tasting as well. Yeah, taste is very, very important. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say is competence, Nick. I mean, we need more, you know, fungus geeks. Uh, the world needs more fungus geeks if we're going to make the shift. We need more fermentation scientists, bioprocess engineers. Um, we need to be, you know, training the next generation that's going to be able to uh, to take this to the next level. So we're very focused on that, on education and training. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have interns coming in, doing projects and so forth, trying to get the future uh, fermentation scientists and bioengineers that, that the industry is going to need. So competence is going to be a, a big, a big, a big factor that's going to determine uh, how we can how we can do things at scale. And you need yeah. more ex Googlers to go into food and technology. Fungus <laughs> geeks and ex Googlers. There you go. <laughs> Good oh, as you say, there are challenges, challenges everywhere from, from, from regulations to consumer acceptance to, I mean, David, you mentioned the, the bioreactor bottleneck. I, I heard recently that if you um, switched 100% of bioreactor capacity in the pharma sector to the production of meat, um, there wouldn't be enough to feed the US um, for yeah. half a day. So it's an enormous challenge. How do you guys sleep at night with all of these challenges? We don't sleep, do we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what... Ingrid's uh, now with this investment round closed, Ingrid gets to sleep for a few weeks. Yeah, uh, yeah so. we're starting again. Definitely. Just there a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, thank you very much for your time. It's been fascinating speaking with you. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to follow on your progress and uh, report some more milestones in 2024. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.